The Smoking Mirror, Chapter 18 Johnny slouched his way along the dark stones of the corridor the black road had become. He felt dizzy and weak, but he refused to let Carol see how drained he really was. She needs me strong. Mom needs me strong. When the time came, he figured he would be able to draw on the savage magic to sustain him. In the meanwhile, he would simply fake it. Before long, the corridor ended at another chamber. A large cave-like structure with shallow pools of mineral water interspersed among stalagmites and other formations. At the center of the chamber lay a large obsidian mirror like the one the little people had used to send the twins to Miklan, but marred by a network of fine cracks that covered its surface like a snarled cobweb. A way out? Thoughts of escape, however, were interrupted by the sight of his mother, just a few yards from the mirror. His heart almost shattered as his animal eyes took in her brutalized form. She had a stone yoke around her neck and a stained, strange glittering rope or cable ran like a, le a, lead, a lead from the yoke to a stalagmite. She was still dressed in the paint speckled jeans and sleeveless blouse she'd been wearing on the day she disappeared. Her dark hair was tangled and matted, her face smeared with grime. Her eyes widened as she saw her daughter standing beside the jaguar. Mama, Carol shouted, and the two of them rushed to her side. Johnny shifted into human form and threw his arms around her. With shuddering sobs, she hugged them tightly. Oh, my beautiful children, how, how did you find me? It was the little people, Carol explained. They used their Che Abba, a mirror like that one, to send us through. Johnny's mother reached up and laid a palm on each of his cheeks. My sweet boy, you're an agual, yes? Yeah, so is Carol. He touched the stone yoke, anger flooding his heart. And we've got the Shosha, Mom, so don't worry. He stepped back out of her embrace and partially shifted into a crocodile. Then his joy and rage mingling in the deepest regions of his soul, Johnny pulled up enough savage, savage magic to close his jaws around the yoke and shatter it. Veronica Quintero de Garza stood, staring at him dumbfounded. Johnny shifted back. He checked his mother's neck to make sure she wasn't too badly bruised or cut, and Carol stroked her hair and brushed the dust from her clothes, trying to help her feel more herself. Children, I am so happy to see you again, their mother said once she had gotten over the shock of seeing her son become a werecroc. But we need to leave this place before Tetzcatlipoca returns. He orchestrated this, you understand. Los Kieraki wants both of you in this chamber with me. I don't know why, but let's not stay and find out. Carol looked around. At the far end of the chamber was another opening leading who knew where. Well, we can't go back the way we came, so... I was actually thinking we could use the mirror, Johnny said. But we don't know the chant, Carol pointed out. No, but we've got, like, savage magic and stuff, Carol. Let's try to focus on the obsidian, see if we can't make it start smoking, and so on. Their mother shook her head. No, on Juan Angel, that's the passageway the Dark Lord uses. I'm pretty certain it doesn't lead back to our world. At least not any good place in our world. Olvidalo. Pero, ma, si intentaramos. I said forget it, mijo. Seriously, it doesn't matter how powerful you think you've become, my love. You are not ready to face a powerful God. We need to go now before... The mirror trembled, and the three of them turned to stare at it. Smoke began curling from the cracks, as if a fire had been kindled beneath it. Strengthening this impression, strange glints of phosphorescence seemed to eddy in the mirror's depths. But then the surface of the mirror bulged, rippling upward as if something within it were pushing out. Like Freddy in the old Nightmare on Elm Street films. Then it was as if the surface of the mirror tore, and an impossibly enormous black-spotted paw thrust itself into the air, bending and stretching forward to sink vicious ebony talons into the rocky dirt. Run! Their mother screamed. Johnny grabbed her hand and dashed toward the passageway, but stalagmites burst upward from the ground behind them to create a wall. Another massive paw ripped through the mirror with an audible groan, as if the very fabric of the world had been rent apart by its grappling claws. Carol pointed at the other side of the mirror, where fewer obstructions blocked the way. The three of them ran around the base of the Che Abba. 
Johnny kept his eyes on the emerging forelegs of the dread beast, which tensed as if against some great weight. With an agonizing howl that thrummed through the mineral ceiling and sent a shower of red dust raining against Johnny's head and back, an indescribably huge jaguar erupted from the mirror, smoke curling from its rippling flesh as it snarled and shook itself. It slammed its paw down in their path, blocking their exit. The ears of the jaguar twitching this way and that nearly scraped the chamber's high dome and its tail slapped angrily against the farthest wall, knocking loose shiny mineral cascades. The rocky earth recoiled against the touch of three of its deadly paws, causing them to sink deep into the ground, the fourth still trapped within the mirror, which is now as glowing and smoky as an awaking fumarole. Leaning its great head down to within an arm's reach of Johnny, the jaguar opened unspeakable, slavering jaws to reveal teeth, the length of a man's leg, and a gullet that glistened darkly with ominous implications. A rumbling growl was born in the depths of this black mountain, building toward a crescendo. But the growl unexpectedly became a voice, a voice like the fulminating roar, but speaking in words Johnny could understand. The jaguar was addressing them in Spanish, antiquated and replete with difficult words, but intelligible nonetheless. Have I your attention, humans? It turned its fiery eyes on Johnny. Do you understand me, boy? The voice was all around him, echoing in the air, trembling in the ground, whispering in the very depths of his soul. He had heard that voice many times before in his darkest dreams. There was no choice but to answer it. Uh, yes? Good. I have been waiting, awaiting you for some time. We have much to discuss. First, however, let me assume a, yet a less theatrical form. The great jaguar began to shudder, its limbs twitching. Then heaving and pulsing, its flesh began to shrink and run together, gradually taking on another form. Though still imposing, the beast was now a giant of a man, standing a half a meter above the tallest Johnny had ever seen. The skin of a jaguar was draped around him like a robe, its head hooding him and enfolding his handsome pale face in shadows. Behind his head, inexplicably floating in space, smoked a black mirror, made as far as Johnny could tell from obsidian. The young man was reminded for a moment of Catholic icons, saints within their circles of light. Except this was a circle of darkness, absolute and purest night. The man wore a gray tunic beneath the robe, decorated with black and gray feathers collected from, Johnny noted, crows and ravens and vultures. His right foot was shod in a sandal, but his left leg tapered to bare bone just above the ankle, and the skeletal left foot appeared to be caught within the slightly convex surface of the mirror that still smoldered on the cave floor. If you have not yet guessed, I am Tezcat Lapoca, boy, enslaver of men, master of earth and sky, enemy of both sides, omnipresent darkness. I effect change, pull down the old ways in favor of stronger ones, destroy the weak. I existed before this world's beginning and I shall be here at its end. An end, I should add, that will come very soon, now that you two have begun to wield the savage magic. Johnny's hands curled into fists, his heart beat wildly, almost painfully in his chest. If you think, he panted, that we're going to help you destroy the universe, then you must be out of your freaking mind. Or maybe you've been chewing on some funky cactus, huh? Johnny, Carol breathed in a nervous warning. His mother gripped his hand tightly. He ignored them both. Yeah, no, you had our mom captive for six months. Our dad nearly lost it. Carol and I were pushed to our limits. You basically screwed our family big time. So, you peg-legged freak, get the hell out of our way before you get a taste of the savage magic you're so excited about. A grin spread, spread across Tetzcat Lapoca's face, baring his feral teeth. You have summed up perfectly, if somewhat inelegantly, the very seed of your enslavement to me. That you are too young or stupid to understand only adds to my enjoyment of your predicament. In any event, please, please make me get out of your way. I have been looking forward to this moment eagerly, boy. Johnny could only focus on the word enslavement. A growl rose from deep within him, as if his tonal were responding to the dark god's taunts. Me too, you scabby old gib. Johnny stopped. His mother's voice was as firm and determined as ever. He couldn't help obeying her. He's goading you. Don't fall into his trap. 
Your mother is very wise, boy, but very mortal. I think I will kill her now. Attempt to stop me, if you dare. Veronica Quintero de Garza dropped to her knees, clutching at her throat and gasping. Pulling away from his mother and sister with a growl, Johnny shifted into the massive harpy eagle and launched himself at Tezcatlipoca, razor-sharp talons raking at the god's face. The Dark Lord leaned out of the way swiftly, reaching up a powerful hand to seize Johnny's legs and fling him toward the cavern floor. Beating mighty wings desperately, he barely managed to avoid slamming brutally against jagged rock. Ah, combat. It has been ages since anyone was stupid enough to attack me. Thank you, boy. It will be a genuine pleasure to grind your mortal flesh against the bare rock of Miklan. A gust of fire rushed at Tezcatlipoca then, and as the god turned to deflect it, Johnny rushed at him. Sinking his talons into the god's shoulders, the Dark Lord grunted and reached back to grab at Johnny, but Carol, in fire serpent form, flung herself through the air, slamming into Tezcatlipoca and curling about him. Johnny began to pound his beak against the god's skull over and over as his sister started to squeeze. Impressive, Tezcatlipoca grunted. Then he simply wasn't there. Johnny and Carol dropped hard, hitting the mirror with a crunching thud. Above them, black smoke coalesced into the form of the god smiling down at them. Then Tezcatlipoca took hold of both their heads and slammed them repeatedly against the ceiling before tossing them casually to either side of the cavern. Johnny, pain exploding within him, felt consciousness slipping, but he held on. Too much blood loss, he thought weakly at his sister. I can't react fast enough. Carol didn't respond. He could barely see her in the shadows of the rocks where she'd fallen. Her hair covered her face, probably unconscious, shifted back. Tezcatlipoca had turned his attention to their mother, who was attempting to run toward Carol. I promised you would be a witness and a tool to your children's destruction. Did I not? Be still then, and behold. Veronica Quintero de Garza was jerked into the air by some invisible force and then violently hurled downward. Johnny gave a startled cry and dropped back into human form, frantically grabbing at his bracelet, searching for, there, a strand of Hoots Hill Pochitle's hair. Gripping it between his thumb and index finger, Johnny shifted. The transformation was dizzying. Power like he had never felt trembled along semi-divine limbs and knowledge of how to use it rose almost instinctively within his mind. Reaching out a pale blue hand, he called his shield to him, and it hurtled toward him his outstretched arm like an obedient hunting hawk. Leave my mother alone, you bastard, he shouted as he flung dark energy at Tezcatlipoca. The Lord of Chaos turned and smiled, spreading wide his arms at the attack. Johnny sent wave after wave of hate-driven, angry black magic pounding against him, but the god absorbed it all. Wonderful, you have delivered yourself to me so utterly that I can scarce believe your naivete. I should have guessed you would ignore all sense, but for you to transform into my very protege, the creature whose life was sustained by lore he learned from me, the irony is simply delicious. Now, slave, feel my mastery of you and despair. The cavern went dark and silent as it filled, as if filled with a spiritual sludge that even now tried to force its way into Johnny's mind and heart. Panicked, he began to push back with all the strength he possessed, but it wasn't enough. Like grappling fingers, the Kuhale poked through his defenses, found a hold, and pried open a hole. A black quiet poured into him that was worse than any nightmare his sister had ever faced. Fleeing the absence that tried to consume him, Johnny retreated into himself. Yes, very astute. Cede control to me, boy. Sit back and watch as I wreak havoc with your own hands. Johnny, as Huitzalpochotli, reached up with his free hand and snapped a stalactite off the ceiling. It was like being a marionette. His limbs moved against his own volition. His demigod body took several steps toward his mother, arms cocking the stalactite back like a baseball bat. His eyes focused on the woman at his feet. He felt a sick smile spread across his corpse blue face. No! Oh yes, she will die by your hand, boy. Johnny gave a wordless howl of frustration. Clinging to his tonal, he reached deep, tapped the savage magic, channeled it against Tez Tezcatlipoca's Kuhale intrusion. 
The god redoubled, tripled the strength of his magical puppeteering. Desperate, Donnie jug dug in his soul, frantically sweeping away everything that impeded the flow of Shosha, memories, emotions, identity. He became an unthinking conduit through which the savage magic swept like a massive flood, ripping at the foundations of his very self. Blue energy erupted like a geyser from his flesh, knocking Tezcatlipoca down, ripping through the rock above their heads, tunneling upward through the roots of the world tree to bore like a laser into the starry sky far above. Yes, Tezcatlipoca shouted triumphant, let it flow, boy. Tear open a hole in heaven and let the end begin. The boy was a beacon. Power burned him clean of anything else but this. He saw the woman twisted on the ground. He saw the girl lifting herself up on her elbows, eyes full of tears. He saw the universe buckle. Soon it would crack. The boy saw no reason for it not to. Let it crack. Let it burn. Let darkness fall forever. Then a small voice whispered. The boy ignored it, but it was insistent. Over and over, it whispered a phrase. He listened, hoping that his attention would silence it. At the end, remember who you are. The boy thought for a moment. He could not remember who he was. He was the beacon, the conduit, the tool. That was all. The most important gift. It already lies within you. But what was the gift? The boy had no idea. He did not know who he was. He had burned clean of any gifts. The universe groaned, ready to split asunder. And then came a song, a beautiful, beautiful song, sung in bereft but loving tones by a familiar voice. Song in Spanish? And with a shuddering rush, the boy recognized his mother, the woman who had loved him more than anyone for as long as he had lived. She had given him his name, and she would whisper it to him every night, thinking him asleep. Te quiero, Juan Angel, tu madre te quiero mucho. I remember who I am, he muttered wonderingly, looking at Tezcatlipoca, whose smile began to fade. I'm Juan Angel Garza, son of Veronica and Oscar, brother of Carolina. And the gift I already have, it's their love, their love, and the love I feel for them. You can't touch that, can you? Tezcatlipoca stood but said nothing. Taking the love Carol's singing had awakened, Johnny shut off the savage magic. Dropping the stalactite, he shifted back into human form and tossed the shield aside. Kill us if you want, he said quietly, but I'm not going to help you destroy the universe. You lose, freak. Game over. Tezcatlipoca stared at him wordlessly for a moment. Then he drew his hands out from beneath the jaguar robe. In his right, he gripped a long, curved obsidian knife. Johnny looked down at his mother, knelt beside her. She was still breathing. Carol, pulling her t-shirt back on, crouched beside him and smiled sadly. Thanks, he told her, reaching for her hand. She nodded, looking over his shoulder at Tezcatlipoca. She addressed the dark god. We're ready. Get it over with. His laugh was not unexpected. Johnny ignored it, stroking his mother's tangled hair. Soon we'll find out what our paths to beyond is mom the three of us together moments stretched into minutes unexpectedly the thrumming of the mirror began and johnny began turned to see tezcatlipoca activating his portal i see by the look in your eyes that you are utterly bewildered good my faith in your stupidity is not unfounded i see you believe that i have lost that this game has concluded Eventually, you will comprehend that everything that has occurred has been according to my plan. I have orchestrated your every step. Johnny quailed inwardly but scoffed and spat. Whatever. You almost brought about the star demon apocalypse or whatever. We shut you down, period. Foolish boy, do you not understand that you would have been destroyed by so much Shoshal long before you could have broken open the Titsimime's prison? You are not strong enough to fulfill the destiny I have prepared for you, but you are much closer than you were scant days ago. With time, I will shape you, boy, into precisely the tool I require, and when you are ready, I plan to wield you effortlessly. In fact, I suspect you will beg me to use you to bring about the end of this world that my brother so stupidly strives to preserve. You will turn your back on him, on your sister, on your parents, and willingly aid me. Johnny stood, his eyes stinging. It'll, it'll be a cold day in hell, he began. Indeed it will. Tezcatlipoca pulled his jaguar cape tight about him 
and stepped into the smoking mirror, disappearing in a black swirl. In the silence that followed, Johnny turned to Carol, tears streaming down his face. Never, you hear me, never. I'll kill myself first, and if I can't, you're going to have to, Carol.